You know, those seniors uh, just kept it positive, kept it encouraging for the, for the young guys and gave them a great platform to follow. Another senior day in the books. I'm Sam Massive, live at the studio set, and I'll talk about how the day went for some important senior players saying goodbye to their time at Temple. Stan Drayton's first season as a head coach has officially wrapped up. We talk growth and the future of this Temple football program. The final episode of Inside the Nest in 2022 is live and it starts right now. final edition of Inside the Nest in 2022. She's Emily Cochran and I'm Luke Milai. We're back from our own bye week and for our final show of the semester, we've got two games to analyze, plus a Temple cornerback in the house. There's a lot to unpack in just 45 short minutes, so let's get into it. It was the season finale for the Owls at Lincoln Financial Field this past Saturday against the ECU Pirates. The Owls in black went ahead 3-0 in the first quarter, but didn't hold the lead for long. Pirates star running back Keaton Mitchell got ECU on the board with a 49-yard touchdown, one of his four touchdowns in the game. But Temple came right back in the second quarter. E.J. Warner found Ahmad Anderson Jr. for a toe-tap touchdown in the back of the end zone to make it 10-7 Temple on the ensuing drive. ECU QB Holden Ehlers drops a dime to Isaiah Winstead for a 14-yard touchdown to put the Pirates on top. But on the next drive, EJ Warner says right back at you and tosses a 40-yard touchdown to Jordan Smith. Warner had five passing touchdowns in the finale, but the Pirates did not stop sailing down the field. Josiah Hatfield ripped off a 97-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. It was his first return score of the season and put ECU ahead 21-17. Later in the quarter, Ehlers fumbles the snap but found Mitchell in the flat. Mitchell helped his QB out by taking a pass from the line of scrimmage 73 yards to the house. This was his longest receiving score of the season and he put the Pirates up by 11. But the Owls didn't walk the flank yet. An ECU pass interference against Jordan Smith on fourth down late in the half kept the Temple drive alive. Five plays later, EJ Warner makes ECU pay, stepping up in the pocket and delivering a 21-yard strike to Zay Baines to make it 28-24 ECU. A Pirates missed field goal holds this 28-24 score at the half. Into the second half we go with the score 28 to 24. EJ Warner with the ball in his hand, scrambling to search for an open receiver, but the ball gets intercepted by Malik Fleming at the Temple 35 yard line. Fleming returns this one 15 yards down the field and out of bounds to the Temple 20. With 11.35 left in the third quarter, it's going to be Mitchell darting into the end zone for an eight-yard ECU touchdown. Temple back with the ball. It's second and eight. Warner hands the ball off to Edward Sadie, and he hustles into the end zone for a 12-yard touchdown. Once again, Mitchell uses his legs and goes in for another ECU touchdown to put the team up 42-31. to Still in the third quarter, the Owls making it a competitive, high-scoring game. E.J. Warner throws a 38-yard dime to a wide-open Jordan Smith. And right after, it's going to be David Martin Robinson who completes the two-point conversion. Let's keep looking at this Temple team. Now in the fourth quarter, Warner throws to Martin Robinson for another six points to put the Temple in the lead. But not for long. Colton Ehlers throws a 38-yarder right into the hands of Jalen Johnson in the final minute to put the Pirates up in this back and forth matchup. The Owls were unable to get the job done with only about a minute left on the clock. All but one pass on this drive was ruled incomplete and the Owls lose in a tough, close battle to end their season. Final score 49 to 46 East Carolina. Temple's overall record is three and nine while its conference is one and seven. Both the exact same numbers as the 2021 season. Warner and the offense went out with a bang in the season finale. Warner set a Temple single game record with 527 passing yards. This performance also made the true freshman the only quarterback in the country to throw for at least 450 yards in multiple games this season. 
Jose Barbon was also a record setter. His 160 receiving yards gave him his sixth 100 plus yard game of the season, the most in a single season in Temple history. His 13 catches on Saturday were the second most in a game for Temple all time. But this game was about the seniors who worked to put Temple back on track this season. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm uh, really proud of our, our young men, especially those seniors. Um, you know, they've been through so much through the pandemic, coaching changing, uh, you know, just a whole lot of uh, uncertainty over the years, a lot of ups and downs, and um, they really left a great example on this on this young football team, and I know they uh, put respect back on this program. And uh, I'll be forever grateful for that senior class, and boy, I would love to have had a, a W on the board for him. Yeah, I mean, from day one, uh, not a lot of people believed me from high school, and he did from day one show that to me how much they wanted me here, and how much priority I was, and just I'm so grateful for this this opportunity to be a part of this program, to come and try to help build up the temple. Um, so yeah, just so excited to be a part of it. Just can't wait to keep getting to work, getting better. And hopefully the next few years we can win more games. This matchup against ECU was the Owls' final matchup of the 2022 season. It was also senior day, and 13 of these Owls were recognized for all of their hard work on the field before kickoff. They were able to take pictures with their families. They received flowers, got pictures with Stan and the entire coaching staff. Sam Massad will have a little bit more on that later in the show, but ultimately it was a tough competitive matchup that was run by Keaton Mitchell in this ECU offense. Unfortunately, the Owls fell up short. You gave a lot of credit to the seniors on this team, but the big focus was the true freshman. E.J. Warner, we mentioned it, career high and Temple record 527 passing yards, also a career high five touchdowns. He had one of the best seasons for a quarterback in Temple history. After this game, he's now has the second most passing yards in a single season all time throwing for over 3,000, joining P.J. Walker. It's the only two Owls to throw for over 3,000. E.J. Warner in the loss was still the big story of the day. And ironically, on Game Day Live this past Sunday, Kurt Warner gave a shout-out to his very own son, E.J. Warner. He played his highlights from the ECU game. He recognizes 527 passing yards, and the whole entire hosting, like, whole group was literally giving EJ so much credit, shouting him out so much. You can really tell that Kurt Warner cares so much about his son and they have such a great bond. He said on the show that dad never did that. And he reminded me of that in a text today that dad never did that. In all seriousness, my young man, you are incredible. The stuff that you have overcome, I am so proud of you. So that was really awesome to see on NFL Network. They have a great bond. He was defending EJ on Twitter <laughs> too a little bit, but we've got to focus on the end of this game. Again, Ehlers was able to throw that big touchdown that ended up winning it for ECU. It's the third time this season we've seen the defense out there in the final minute with a chance to win the game against Navy, Houston, and now ECU. A couple of close losses, but I think that's what comes with learning how to win. I mean, this is a team that's rebuilding trying to take that next step. These are the games that you expect Temple to win next season. They're competing in them this year, then they'll win them next year. That's sort of the feeling with these close losses down the stretch. Absolutely. Now on Saturday, that feeling of a final game was front and center for these 13 seniors. We now turn it over to Sam Massad, who is at the studio set to tell us more. Hey, Sam. Thanks, guys. This past Saturday was a bittersweet day. That's usually the case for seniors on senior day. This game had many highlights, with one of the most memorable parts coming before kickoff. It was a day full of emotion at Lincoln Financial Field. The Owls hosted the East Carolina Pirates in their season finale. And with that last game comes one last chance to celebrate the 2022 class of seniors. I'll be forever grateful for that senior class. And boy, I would love to have had a, a W on the board for them. But they've done so much uh, that won't get taken for granted. Key players such as Adam Klein, Isaac Moore, Mackenzie Morgan, among others, stepped on this field for the last time as an owl. Adonicus Sanders is also among this list, but he notably had to spend his senior day on the sideline due to injury. Prior to this game, Coach Drayton gave out his final single digit to defensive lineman Zach Gill for his leadership and dedication to the team. Gill took the field wearing number eight instead of his regular 91. Uh, honestly, it was just a blessing. Uh, you know, it was the highest honor, you know, coming from the program. And uh, 
I mean, I really give a lot of credit to my teammates just because they push, push me every day. Heading into this one, there is an added incentive to win for the 13 seniors going into their last game. The Owls were able to take the Pirates down to a nail biter and nearly pulling off the upset, but ultimately couldn't get it done. Although the outcome was heartbreaking, the senior Owls from the team, spirit squads and marching band were soaking in every moment alongside their teammates, friends and families for their final time at the link. Among these seniors saying goodbye included our very own Emily Cochran. She got the best seat in the house to cheer on Temple during the weekends over these last four years. Of course, she's also one of our fearless leaders on the anchor desk each Tuesday. Congrats, Em, on a successful four years on the cheer team. As for the football team, yes, the Owls are finished the season with the same 3-9 and nine record as last season, but according to Jordan McGee, Adam Klein, and Coach Drayton, this team is not the same 3-9 and nine team we saw in 2021. Drayton said over and over that he cannot wait to get this team to the offseason. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Sam Massad. Back to you guys on desk. Thank you, Sam. Now with Senior Day wrapping up, it's only right to honor a couple of the guys that are graduating this season, and we've got a few that have been here for the long haul. I'm starting with offensive tackle Isaac Moore. He's been with the Owls for five seasons, breaking the school record for consecutive games played with 55. He's a single digit and a captain for his leadership on and off the field as well, so my spotlight is on Isaac Moore. My senior spotlight is going to fifth-year offensive lineman Adam Klein. Klein was a part of the 2018 recruiting class, and his first career start was against Tulsa. He was generally a starter in all five of his seasons and earned a single digit his senior year. He also serves as a captain on the team. He is admired by many of his teammates and coaches and always has a positive mindset on and off the field. Klein would love to extend his career and play in the NFL, but if football doesn't work out, he would also love to pursue a career in coaching. Now, before senior day, the Owls were on the field pre-Thanksgiving. Emily and the Owls were out there toughing through a chilly afternoon at the link when the Owls took on Cincinnati. Since he flew down the field on its first drive, chewing up five minutes on 12 plays, but the Owls built a brick wall at the goal line on third and fourth down to keep the game scoreless. The Owls were unable to capitalize and had to punt after going three and out deep in their own territory. A few drives later, Cincy QB Ben Bryant began to heat up. Bryant found Tyler Scott for a 23-yard gain on third down to keep the drive alive. And on the next play, Bryant delivers a ball to Trey Tucker for a 42-yard touchdown to put Cincinnati on the board. Things started to unravel fast for the Owls. Ed Sadie fumbled for the first time this season, and two plays later, the Bearcats are back in the end zone. A seven-yard touchdown run by Ryan Montgomery put Cincinnati ahead 14-0 midway through the second quarter. Then E.J. Warner found David Martin Robinson for a 25-yard gain, his longest completion of the afternoon. A field goal for the Owls made it 17-3 at the half. Now moving into the second half and it's first and 10. Evan Prater searching for an open receiver but can't get the ball out before Leighton Jordan sacks him for a loss of seven yards to the Cincy 48. After Temple goes three and out, the Bearcats have the ball again. Prater runs for 15 yards out of balance for a Cincy first down. The Owls with the ball now. Warner passes to Dewan Mathis for 19 yards and a Temple first down. This puts the Owls in the red zone, but an interception by safety Byron threats stuns the Owls scoring hopes. The Bearcats use this momentum to tack on another field goal and that's your football game. Final score 23 to 3. Now let's take a look at some big plays from these past two games. This might be one of my favorite plays of the entire season and it calls for definitely one of the biggest booms as well. It's the first quarter, third and goal at the goal line. Let's play it. So as you can see, the ball gets handed off to Corey Kiner. He tries to leap over this Temple defense. Pulls it right here. Jordan McGee picks him up with both of his hands. You can play it right now. Ready? Set. Boom! <laughs> he gets completely stuffed by this entire Temple defense. Let's take another look at it one more time. Jordan McGee does a great job at pushing him far away from the end zone, not allowing him to get a single yard, and it ended up being a turnover on downs. So now my play comes at the end of the ECU game, the play that ultimately gave ECU the win. You can play it right here. It's second and 10. Holt Nailers, the quarterback, rolls through some tough pressure from Leighton Jordan and launches a touchdown down the field to Jalen Johnson. This was the final score that gave ECU the win. So we'll watch it again.
again here. Just a minute 20 left. Pause it right here. Leighton Jordan had a nasty spin move on the left <laughs> tackle to get to Ailers. More nine times out of ten, he's going to get this sack, and the Owls are in business. But play it right here. Ailers is able to escape. He gets ahead of the defensive line and pause it again right here. It's second and ten for ECU. I don't think anyone would have thought anything of it if Ailers just tried to take these ten yards on the ground, and maybe that's what the Owls thought because he has all this room, but instead he has the frame of mind. You can play it right here to launch it right at the line of scrimmage into the hands of Jalen Johnson and ultimately win the game for ECU. Awesome. So we're up against our first break of the day. When we come back, we'll talk to a key contributor on Temple's defense this season. That's right. Redshirt freshman and single digit Jalen McMurray joins us to discuss his thoughts on the season now that it's come to an end. Inside the Nest will be back in just 90 seconds. Welcome back to Inside the Nest. Redshirt freshman and single digit Jalen McMurray totaled 49 total tackles this season, second most among secondary players. McMurray was a huge force in the secondary this season. He led the team in pass breakups with seven and was second with two forced fumbles. And you know he had to get a pick. He had an interception <laughs> against ECU in prime time at the link. And he joins us now live on the desk. Jalen, thank you so much for coming on. I want to start by asking you about your development. In 2021, you only played a couple of games. This year, you're the number one corner. You're a single digit. Can you tell me a bit about your development? Yeah, no, it's definitely been a great experience these last couple of years. Obviously, my first year, I registered it. Um, then the second year, like kind of during the off season, like with this new coaching staff, they kind of brought me in and gave all gave everyone like equal opportunity you know and and I was blessed enough to be able to take advantage of it and and take advantage of, of that off season awesome mm -hmm. and both the 2021 and 2022 teams went three and nine mm -hmm. but a lot of people keep saying that this three and nine team this year is yeah. much different than last mm -hmm. year but what makes it so different yeah no I, I would say more so last year's team like you would see like underlining stuff like like not being able to finish games, not being able to start games fast and all that, not necessarily competing. And, and this team right here, especially with this new coaching staff, the new mindset, new culture that we're trying to create, um, we're definitely competing. We're definitely fighting every game, every practice, coming in with a positive mindset every time. Now you've mentioned the new coaching staff, the new mm -hmm. culture. How would you describe that culture after seeing last year's culture and now mm -hmm. compare it to this year? Um, I would say – one word would be like electric like they they bring in energy positive energy um constructive criticism so they're going to tell you when you mess up they're going to tell you what you need to fix and and this coaching staff has has been just great for all of us you know for all like our development not only on the field but off the field as well Jalen, thank you so much for joining of us course, today of course and we're up against another break. When we come back, we'll take a look at how the rest of the conference fared as the regular season wrapped up. Coming up, we go into full discussion mode with our crew of four while also highlighting the top five plays of the season. Inside the Nest will be right back after this. Welcome back to Inside the Nest. Former Temple football head coach Matt Rule was fired 50 days ago by the Carolina Panthers. But less than two months later, he's found his new home and it's back at the college ranks. Nebraska is bringing in Rule after an underwhelming 4-8 season that put them near the bottom of the Big Ten. Rule's record as a college coach doesn't seem too impressive on the surface, but his three 10-plus win seasons and five bowl trips in seven college seasons speaks for itself. No bowl trips for this season's Temple team, but there's still a lot to look back at over the last 13 weeks. Inside the Nest reporter Jake Gable joins us live from the studio set to take us back in time to that first game in September against Duke. Hey, Jake. Hey, Emily. Temple has had quite the eventful season, for better and worse. Let's start in week one when the Owls traveled down to Duke and got blown out by 30 to nothing. I'm sure that wasn't exactly the head coaching debut Stan Drayton had in mind. Next week, Temple got its first win, however, and it came when starting quarterback Dewan Mathis got benched for true freshman E.J. Warner. It's crazy to think that Mathis is a wide receiver, and back then, E.J. Warner was just known as Kurt Warner's son. The very next week, Warner made his first start at QB and kept the job the rest of the season. Temple lost a close game against Rutgers 16-14, a big improvement from their loss against Rutgers last season 61-14. Now we're going to jump ahead to bye week. 
Temple had a 2-3 and three record and one, was one of the statistically best defenses in the nation. Third in the country in pass defense, 12th in the nation in yards allowed per game, and 20th in the nation in points allowed per game. Then came the UCF game right after the bye, which single-handedly took Temple's defense out of all the metrics I just mentioned after giving up 70 points to UCF. To put that in perspective, Temple's defense allowed 84 points in its first five games combined. Next, we'll jump ahead to the USF win, Temple's last of the season. This is where EJ Warner really started to find his groove. Warner threw for over 1,500 yards in his last four games of the season. Our last stop on the timeline is a familiar one, the ECU game. Temple almost pulled off the upset win for its seniors on senior day, while EJ Warner had a record-setting day. It all adds up to a 3-9 record, just one win in the American, but the Owls were just a few seconds away for two more wins. And as you've heard today, it's hard to not argue that this team isn't moving in the right direction. Absolutely. Now, with us all on the desk for the very first time, we're going to ask some questions. How would you guys rate Stan Drayton's first year as a head coach, out of a scale of 1 to 10? Uh, I'll give him an 8. The record doesn't really back that up that much, but I love the culture that he's implemented, and there's an argument that Temple could have won seven games this year. I mean, there were so many close games against Houston, Navy. They could have won a lot more games than they did. Absolutely. I'm going to have to give him a 7. Um, after hearing Stan through like every presser or post-game like game conference, um, you can just hear the love that he has for this team on and off the field, which is why I want to rate him so high. But at the end of the day, he did still end the season three and nine. Um, but he's also still learning with this team, too. And I think he's going to really build this team to have a bright future. I'm with you. I'm going with a seven as well for Stan Drayton. I don't know if I'd say they could have had seven wins this <laughs> season, but it was a step in the right direction. All Stan Drayton had to do this year was change the culture and get Temple football to be respected again. And I think that's what he did, even with winning just the three games. The record isn't important this year. He gained respect for Temple football. I'm with you guys. I'm giving him an eight. I think that an immediate turnaround in culture is arguably much more important than stats, numbers, everything in between. And I just think, especially for a growing program, a good foundation for a football team starts with the culture. And I think Stan Drayton has really brought the energy for this culture this season. So I'm excited to see what he does in 2023. Now for the next question, speaking of culture, with Rod Carey out, this era is done. We got Stan Drayton in here. Do we think that a growing culture is enough for players to stay here? I don't think I'd say a culture alone is enough to stay here, but I really think that there's just so much bright spots going on right now. I mean, a lot of players are excelling, Leighton Jordan, EJ Warner. People are putting up big time stats. And also, the Owls have a good track record of getting people into the NFL. I think they have the, I mean, they do have the most uh, Owls in the NFL or players in the NFL that from a non Power Five school. So it's pretty impressive numbers. Yeah, I, I think it is because there's a lot of um, exciting things to look forward to. There's no doubt that Stan has this locker room more than Rod Carey did. And he's so eager. They, we've been saying it over and over. He's so eager to get this team to the offseason. And he's building all this momentum for these new AAC teams that are coming in. And Temple has that upper hand because they have like so much more experience against these big teams, maybe not as much as these new AAC teams do coming in. Sam, I'm with you again. I think culture is enough in this case to keep guys in the building. If Stan Drayton was telling us the truth all season and these guys were really practicing as hard as they were and really felt like they were as close as they were, why wouldn't you want to come back? They were three and nine, but we've said it a million times in just 26 minutes during this show. This team is on the <laughs> brink. They are ready to break through. I am guaranteeing a 2023 Three bowl appearance for the Owls. Yoda. That should be okay. enough to entice guys oh to come God. back. All right, I'm stuck in the middle for this one as well, guys. I think a growing culture, obviously, extremely important, and I think that's going to keep guys here, but at the same time, NIL agreements having to do with money, the transfer portal, extra years of eligibility are all factors that go into a player's decision to stay or leave. So I'm in the middle. I think it'll be enough for, player, for some players, but not enough for others. All right, last question. What is the defining moment of this 2022 season for you guys? I'm actually going to say the UCF game. I mean, it was a wake-up call because they, they lost by a lot, 70 to 13. But after that, nearly every single game except that Cincinnati game at the end was a one-score game. I mean, overtime loss against Navy, last-second touchdowns against Houston and ECU. They beat USF. 
So I think that they've really built momentum after that loss. I think a, a topic we've been talking about for how long now, the emergence of EJ Warner. This quarterback situation has been a question mark over like the past few seasons. And looking at EJ, it looks like they have a QB for like the long run. And he's made so much growth as a freshman. He's so composed in the pocket. He's getting comfortable with receivers. And he's putting up these numbers that are breaking in Temple history. My point is very similar to yours, Sam, but I'm going to focus on Dewan Mathis. Dewan Mathis losing that QB1 position and moving to wide receiver was my defining moment because without this, we would have never seen the emergence of EJ Warner and what he can do on the field. And although I think people were a little hesitant to put him in that position because of his age and inexperience in collegiate football, I think it was one of the best decisions that Stan Drayton and this coaching staff could have done this season. You guys all made great points. I'm going to the Rutgers game, and I think this was the first time Temple was tested and they competed. They got blown out at Duke, and they won the two games they should have against UMass and Lafayette. Rutgers was their first test, and they hung right in. They only lost 16-14. to 14. It was one of the most competitive games of the season for this team. This is where we saw the emergence of late. And Jordan getting a bunch of sacks and the defense keeping the Owls in this game. That's where they built their identity. So for me, that was really the turning point in this season. So we looked at a couple of the defining moments in this season, but now it's time to look at some of the top plays of the season. Us four and our two producers have picked our top plays from the 2022 season. My top pick is going back to week nine with Temple's biggest run game of the year, especially with this 75 yard rushing touchdown carried by Ed Sadie to start the second half against USF. Sadie had the best game of his career, racking up 265 yards and three touchdowns, all for just one game. Coming up at four is my pick, which set up the field goal that sent Temple into overtime against Navy. EJ Warner throws a pass to Ahmad Anderson Jr. And look at this one-handed catch. Not only that, but he hauls it in and takes it all the way to the five-yard line. I mean, look at this. Not only does he have blue for hands, but he had to do a 180 turnaround to find that ball. For number three, this was by far one of my favorite plays of the season. EJ Warner fakes the handoff, and look at this. Adonica Sanders with the one-handed catch. I don't even know what to call the celebration dance, but it's amazing. Now, for pick uh, number, what is this? Two, our producers, Liam and Jake, picked a good one. We believe this fake field goal touchdown by Mackenzie Morgan, a 28-year-old, that's right, 28-year-old punter should be number one, but they were unfortunately outvoted in the end. The number one play is my pick, or as our producer Jake Jesperger said it, Jordan's pick. Leighton Jordan's one-handed interception against UMass was the most impressive of the season. And not only did he snag the pass, he took it back to the end zone for six, one of his three touchdowns this year. We probably could have picked any of those touchdowns for the top play on this list. While it's no surprise the Owls aren't in contention for the AAC championship, let's take a look at who is. Before this past weekend, there were four teams vying for the top two spots. UCF, Cincinnati, and Tulane had the best odds. Houston needed a win and help that it didn't get. For Tulane and Cincy, they squared off with each other in a win, and they're in scenario. And for a chance at the trophy, UCF just needed to be AAC seller dweller USF. Here's what happened. The Green Wave were trying to flip last season's 2-10 record into a 10-2 campaign, while the Bearcats wanted a shot to three-peat as conference champs. In the second quarter, it's Ty J Spears for the Green Wave, taking the carry and moving to the right side and scoring the touchdown for Tulane to go ahead 10-3. It was a big score because since he was still using backup QB Evan Prater after their starter Ben Bryant got hurt against Temple the year the week prior. This meant they had to rely on the run, and Charles McClellan stepped up. He took this carry 35 yards for the score to tie the game up at 10. It was the first of three rushing scores for the Bearcats. In the second half now, Tulane up three. There goes that man again. Spears back in the end zone for his second touchdown of the game to put the green wave up 10. But here come the Bearcats. Late in the third, Ryan Montgomery took this one eight yards for the score to chip away at the Tulane lead. Midway through the fourth, it's Montgomery again. He scored on a 15-yard run this time to put Cincy ahead and just six minutes away from a trip to the title game. But just over a minute later, Michael Pratt steps back and hits Deuce Watts for the go-ahead and game-winning touchdown. Tulane heads to the AAC Championship, winning 27-24. to Now, on to this back and forth South Florida UCF game. John Rice Plumley gets hit while making this throw, but Ryan O'Keefe completes the catch for the night's fourth touchdown of the day. 
into the third quarter. South Florida with the ball. It's sophomore running back Brian Beatty dodging all of these defenders and taking this one 68 yards down for a first down and completely burning this night's offense. defense. This led to a Byron Brown QB sneak touchdown right up the middle. The Bulls with the ball once again, and Beatty has it. Look, he's dragged down, but he stays on his feet to complete the 14-yard touchdown to make the game competitive. The Knights offense back on the field here in the fourth quarter. Kobe Hudson completes this one to put UCF up 38 to 32. Touchdowns on touchdowns. Take a look at this one. The Bulls aren't playing around. Brown runs in for another touchdown, 17 yards down the field. And for the first time in the game, the Bulls are up. UCF's Mikey Keene scrambles to find an open receiver, and it's going to be number one, Javon Barker, diving headfirst in to make that 41-yard catch. A few plays later, Keene finds tight end Alec Holler for this wild one-handed catch to put the Knights back in the lead with three seconds left in the game. Brown searches for the right guy and attempts a deep ball to Holden Willis but he can't hold on to it. It was a close one. Final score, 46-39 UCF. These games bring us to the conference championship matchup between the Knights and the Green Wave on Saturday. We now turn it over to Al Sport Update reporter Max Green for more on this championship matchup. Hey, Max. Thanks, guys. The people asked for more of the green room, and I'm here to deliver. Today, I'm talking about the AAC championship, Tulane UCF. It's not the championship the pundits were expecting coming into the season, but it's a must-watch matchup for the title and bragging rights of the AAC. Starting with UCF, I'm looking at the quarterbacks and how they'll match up against a green wave defense that gives up less than 185 passing yards a game. UCF has the ability to counter that with the dual threat ability of John Reese Plumley, who both excels at throwing the ball, but more importantly, rushing the ball, having over 900 rush yards on the season and 11 rush TDs. Now Plumley is on the injury report, but he has not been ruled out yet. But if he is out, Mikey Keene is very capable of filling in and running this Golden Knights offense, as Keene has completed over 72% of his passes, throwing for 647 yards, six touchdowns, and only one interception, meaning he is both efficient and safe with the football. Looking at Tulane, where I believe running back Ty J. Spears, who has amassed over 1,100 yards and 14 touchdowns on the season, is the key to this Green Wave offense. And he has a tough task of going against one of the strongest run defenses in the AAC and UCF, who gives up a little under 150 yards a game on the ground. Which leads to what I believe the game will come down to. Whoever runs the ball better on Saturday, and with Plumlee in doubt, I give that slight advantage to Tulane. That's right, the green room is riding with the green wave as your 2022 AAC champions. Reporting from the studio set, I'm Max Green. Luke and Emily, back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Max. We're up against our final break. When we come back, we'll go no huddle for the final time this season. One final go around when Inside the Nest returns. Welcome back to Inside the Nest. The clock is winding down on our season at the desk, so we've got to move a bit quicker. For the last time this semester, let's go no huddle. All right, first question. If you were EJ Warner, would you stay at Temple or would you leave? If I'm EJ, I'm staying. People transfer when things aren't going well and when they want to look better. For EJ, things couldn't have gone much better. I said it earlier in the show, he's now second all time in passing yards in a single season for Temple. He is a true freshman and he missed the first game. EJ Warner couldn't have had it any better and next season he'll take another leap. I'm with you on this one. If I were EJ, I would stick with the program at least for another year. There is no doubt with his name and talent that he could go to other places, but Temple seems to be like a perfect fit for him because he's so young. Stan Drayton will likely build his team around him. And although he could have options, Temple gives him the best shot at growth. All right, question two. Which player are you most excited to see take that next leap next season? For me, it's going to be the fully recovered Dayton Mar David Martin Robinson. Take it to the next level. He missed the first three games of the season, but had his first start since November of 2021 in the win against UMass. Out of the eight games he has played this season, Martin Robinson had 33 receptions and two touchdowns progressing in each game. I'm excited to see him start fully recovered next season. For me, I'm going with Ahmad Anderson Jr. He's going to have a breakout near year next year. We saw him have a fantastic final month of the season with at least 90 yards in three of the last five games, along with four touchdowns in that span. With Adonica Sanders graduating, there will be even more targets to go around for Anderson. Absolutely. 
Last question of the day. Big AAC championship coming between Tulane and UCF. Luke, who you got? I'm going with the green room and going with the green wave. Tulane is playing their best football of the season right now, and UCF beat them a bit earlier in the year. Tulane's a tough team to beat twice. I've got the green wave. I'm not. Rolling with the green wave, I'm riding with the green wave. Keep in mind that this is a team that was projected to go seventh in the conference this year, but they have completely turned things around. Tulane is going into this matchup with loads of momentum after huge wins against Cincy and SMU. As high of hopes I have for UCF this season, I see this game being a toss-up, but ultimately I have to go with Tulane on this one. This is a huge deal for the Green Wave, considering they went from worst to first in one season, and they definitely have the momentum going. With Plumlee questionable to play, it only gives Tulane's number one defense another advantage. How about you? I'll be the odd man out. I disagree with you all. I have UCF winning this one. Let's not forget, this is the same UCF team that scored 70 points against the Owls earlier this season. I think John Rice Plumley, if he is able to play, can run all over the Tulane team that he beat earlier this season. Now, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the competition we had going on in Studio 3 all semester. The end of the season marks the end of our game predictions in 2022. Jake Gable is the official winner of our game score predictions. And the kid went undefeated with a 12-0 record, while Luke and Sam ended up tying it at 11-1. But for me, I was two games off. At least I can say I took that early risk in week one. Jake Gable, Floyd Mayweather, the 72 <laughs> Dolphins, all undefeated in the history books. Jake, <laughs> if it couldn't be me, I'm glad it was you. With that being said, Jake, buddy, I got something for you. Something special for your accomplishments this semester. Here you go, uh, King, right there. Thank, there it is. Thank you. Thank you guys all so much. I'd like to thank my mom, my dad, my third grade music teacher, and most importantly, the refs for graciously accepting all of my bribes. <laughs> While we let Jake have his moment, it's time for our last break of the day. Up next, we preview two live Al Sports Update shows that will be coming to you next semester. We've got our final goodbyes and a look ahead at a brand new documentary when Inside the Nest returns. Welcome back. As our final show comes to a close, we can't help but be excited for a special Al Sports Update production on TU TV coming up right after this show. Our producer Jake Jessberger and Al Sports Update anchor AJ Patel have been working on a special project following the journey of a historic Temple football player who is now a current NFL head coach. This is Tampa Todd and it premieres today at 1245 all on TU TV. Now before we wrap things up, I wanted to say a little something before we say goodbye. I joined Al Sports Update my freshman year after a few friends of mine convinced me. And after that very first meeting I attended, we were all sent home due to the coronavirus taking away almost two years of an in-person college experience. Once I got back sophomore year, my first role was to write a Temple Football two-minute article for the website. It wasn't the best, but it was a start. Never in my wildest dreams could I have ever imagined anchoring this show and talking Temple football for 45 minutes each week. I've been blessed to work with so many outstanding people. I'd like to thank this entire ITN crew for giving me the confidence I never thought I'd gain as a woman in the sports industry and for making me laugh so hard I cry for 13 weeks straight. I'd also like to thank Luke for being the best co-anchor in the world and believing me when I couldn't even believe in myself. I hope you all enjoyed watching as much as we all enjoyed hosting. Emily, it's been a pleasure working these 13 shows with you and sharing the desk with you. But I want to thank everyone else as well. I want to thank Hayden, John, and Brendan for all the hard work they put in behind the scenes, editing our footage, TDing our shows, and building all the graphics. Sam and Jake, you guys have done a fantastic job in your reporter roles this season. You've made the show 10 times better with your packages, but I'm just so proud of the growth you guys have shown this semester. Last but not least, the men in charge, Liam Mandel and Jake Jesperger. You guys have been incredible leaders and producers throughout this entire process and have made things so much easier on me and Emily. It is a joy to work with you guys. And I want to give a special shout out to Jake producing his <laughs> final show today. And for all the hard work he put in on the Tampa Todd documentary, you'll see right after this show. So keep it right here to watch that. And finally, I couldn't forget our professor and executive producer, Matt Fine. Thank you for trusting in me and believing in me in this role. I'll always trust the fine. And remember, it's not over. There's spring shows. We've spring got courts shows. in session live on Tuesdays, 30 minutes. The Sports Brief on Mondays. Owl Sports Update back on Thursdays. Basketball, basketball, basketball. For the last time this semester, we're talking football. He's Luke Milai. I'm Emily Cochran. Have a lovely day, everybody.